What an amazing uh, innovation we saw today. Um, and I don't know what was more uh, exciting, the innovation around AI or 3D, uh, or the fact that we had more doctors on stage than there are at the Royal North Shore Hospital. Um, <laughs> and that just tells you the type of uh, quality of people that we have in the company. Uh, to also represent what our customers are doing, we have this fantastic panel, and I really appreciate the, the diversity of the panel from the construction and engineering space to the solar industry, to the architectural and design industry as well. And I think that this is a really important part of how, we, um, uh, how you see uh, and how you can use our, techno our technology in a, in a better way. Uh, one of the interesting statistics that Rob mentioned was the fact that 80% um, of people that use NEMAP have never bought aerial imagery before. That's a really staggering um, uh, number because it means that we've made it available to a variety of different people that have never been able to use that level of technology in the past. But a lot of people have been using it for a long time and previously to, to NEMAP, but it has exposed them to a whole series of examples from saving koalas up in Queensland to the, to the food truck example that Rob mentioned. These are organisations and companies that have never been able to use it before. So let's start with, um, with, with you, Kieran, uh, over at, uh, at Lendlease. Uh, probably building one of the most iconic areas, which is where NEMAP is, is up uh, in Barangaroo. Uh, tell me how um, technology, particularly aerial technology, has helped uh, Lend-Lease uh, build out such an amazing precinct. Well, it's great, I, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak on the panel today. Um, one of the things that we think quite a bit about at Lend-Lease is um, the concept of place. Uh, so we've, we've been around for a long time, um, founded in Australia in the mid-60s. Uh, and there's not a lot of things that we haven't built, we haven't uh, demolished, we haven't created. And one of the things that is really important to us um, as a company is how we create places that people want to be in. Um, places that people work, people that places play, and where they have experiences, right? And what this means is, is it, it goes beyond just traditional building. So um, access to information which informs the way that people will experience those places, but also how those places will sit in the rest of the environment. So as a large scale builder, we, we very rarely like just building individual um, buildings. We, we quite like what we would like to call the integrated model, where we'll mix residential, commercial, industrial, open spaces. And what that means is, is we have a heavy hand on the environment and we talk a lot about this race for space. Um, the next generation of our company and the next generation of other companies will not really be who can build the best stuff, but actually who can get access to the best places to build these. And is, that, is the technology driving a lot of those decisions? And, and the technology is driving that because in the old days, you used to be able to do it through traditional business development, relationships, these sort of things. But what makes a good place now um, is actually more informed by the data that you collect around those and the way that they sit in the environment than ever before. Mm. We, we get a lot of uh, questions from our customers, mostly governments and large organisations, about how we create different types of experiences. And we're finding more and more that technology is helping us to inform the way that we design these places. You know, what does an innovation district look like? How do you make these places connected to transport? How do you make them um, easy for people to get to and easy for people to experience? And being able to, you know, um, scenario plan these in um, tools like NearMap, we're, we're a big user of NearMap, right, um, is really important to us because it allows us to take what we know and then take what others know, and then actually create an intersection together. between the two. And I, th and I think one of the things that was interesting about Mike's presentation was the, not only just the one data set, but the mo multiple data sets that you can collect, uh, either from us or from other people, that you can put together and have the ability to get really, really well form informed decisions. So the data is going to help drive a lot of those. Yeah, look, we, we, we think quite a bit about what's going to disrupt our industry. So oh, I'm sure everybody in this room knows that. Construction, one of the things that we do is now literally the bottom of the most digitised industries in the world, under agriculture, which is enormously embarrassing. Uh, and we think, we're thinking quite a lot about 
what it is and who it is and how that part of our industry will be disrupted. There's always going to be people who will need to physically create, but the boundaries to being able to create places and design and, and work out how you build are becoming incredibly low now. So we're finding technology is really driving up um, the competitors from the tier two, tier three and tier four builders. And that allows them to elevate themselves to our level really quickly and really easily. So particularly these technologies are really commoditizing that development space in our industry. It's, and uh, Steve, you're in that space. You're in that design and uh, and and development, the, site, the design and the the, uh, the proposal, if you like, of of, a, of how to construct a building and present it to clients. How is that? How is this sort of level of technology or the technology disruption that you're seeing in your space yeah. either helping or not? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'll preface the question, Harvey, with just a bit of background that BIM Consulting is a subsidiary technology company to Architectus. So I'm a principal at Architectus and I run the uh, technology part of that business. And um, just to, to understand that by, by putting that sort of critical mass, you know, we have 25 technology specialists across um, Australia who are really looking to look to those technologies to provide, you know, best, our best offer to our clients and to our projects. And I'm glad you mentioned the, the, the client element here because a lot of what we do as designers is around communicating and selling an idea. Idea. And it's really fundamentally important that we not only use the uh, information that we get from the likes of Nearmap and other platforms to analyse and make better decisions, but it's the way that we communicate those decisions and, and you know, tools like that are, mm. are really good at, 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 at um, delivering that. Yeah. One of the uh, really early use cases uh, for Nearmap were uh, people sort of avoiding getting people up on roofs, uh, either to measure and quote or to... Um, to do things a little bit much, much easier. And I think the, the adoption of, of solar particularly has, uh, has enabled a lot of people to use our technology to make their work easier. Stefan, in your world, how are, you must be very proud of the fact that Australia has now reached over 2 million households in solar, uh, which means that people are adopting it in the right way. And we'll see some examples of that through AI in Mike's presentation. How are you seeing the adoption of this type of technology in your industry? Um, probably the most important aspect of it is that it massively reduces the cost of customer acquisition. So previously you did have to go out to site, get up on the roof, measure it, get your sun eye out, look at where the shading was, all that sort of stuff. And that, that costs money to send someone in a truck out there to do that. Um, these days with near maps and, and programs like that, you're able to give someone an accurate, reliable, believable quote an estimate of what exactly will be put on and what it will look mm. like yeah. from your desktop. So you've, you know, you've taken your cost of providing someone a quote from $500 down to $50. Mm. And given that solar systems now are costing the average person under $5,000 to put on their roof, um, that's a big saving. That's a really material saving. And by the way, for anyone out there who's got a roof and doesn't have solar on it, do you have rocks in your head? <laughs> Honestly, it's the best investment you will make in your entire life. I I, of course. I think I said to Stefan when we were talking before, solar is literally money for nothing. Yeah, no, I, I, I believe that as well. And, and caveat, I don't make anything out of solar solar. So I'm not going to sell you a solar system. <laughs> I'm not blowing my own company. I just don't understand why you don't have it. So, so I wanted to just touch, something, uh, touch on something you said before around safety, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the things which is very transformational for us um, as a large employer of people to do construction work, right? So we, we have a commitment um, which is burnt into our DNA um, to make sure that everybody who works for Lend-Lease um, has the right to go home at the end of the day. Yeah. So a as you know, participants in our industry, which even in 2019 still routinely kills people, um, it's something that we think about quite a bit, right? And how you manage construction is all around proximity. And one of the things that massively high quality aerial imaging and all those type of data, it allows us to take the risk out of people getting injured on yeah. our jobs. And that's a real, yeah. like that's a real non-financial sort of benefit of these things, but it's a critical sort of thing that we think about. In our Perth uh, panel, we actually had a, um, a, a roofer, a, a gentleman that you know, drives around and measures and quotes and uh, puts roofs up in people's homes, and that's his own company, his own contractor. And the interesting thing about uh, what he was saying to me was the fact that it's not so much just the ability to save time to go to those things and climb in a, in a ladder, which is risky and dangerous. 
And he had, gave me an example of a roof that was burnt down. And so, you know, it was burnt, the whole thing was burnt down. It was impossible for him to even get up on a ladder if he wanted to see it. The only way he was able to get a proper measure and quote was through imagery. So it, it kind of has that element of absolute. Uh, in fact, another example, just going back into that sort of same roofing uh, industry specifically, uh, there's, uh, we, we interviewed a company in the United States where they send out 12 uh, trucks every Friday to do a measure and quote. Um, and they don't do that anymore because they can do all the measure and quote on their machine, on their, on their laptops. Uh, but what was interesting to them wasn't the fact that they're saving money uh, sending these people out, it was the fact that they were saving carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And they calculated how much CO2 emissions were sending out from their trucks every time they had to go. So for them, what was really important might be different for other people. And I think these use cases become really, really interesting. Um, Stephen, in your world, I think you see a lot of use cases. Uh, tell us something that you could see that, you know, that, that has been sort of weren't here a while ago and sort of now you're kind of seeing even more. Sure. And uh, a lot of this um, resonated with when I saw Tom present earlier on the, th the application of 3D modelling. And that's, you know, really my life is virtualising things um, that exist in the real world, um, whether they're to be designed and built or whether they are um, modelling of existing conditions. So we'll do anything from use our laser scanner to capture historic buildings internally because um, it serves our interior design department. Anything from that to starting to use the, the at a city scale, um, the ability to feed that back into our urban design, uh, sorry, urban design and planning team so that they can undertake their analysis um, in all sorts of ways, shapes and forms. And it could be that we're serving our commercial um, department who are looking at individual city blocks. Um, you know, we're a very compliant heavy um, industry right now, so things like if you're building, there's um, lots of compliance measures, lots of regulations to observe around height, around access to solar, around the distribution of um, um, views. So I think our, our firm look a lot at um, view impact analysis and we, we um, make a business of that. And so th um, these ideas of being able to put a proposal up and see the impact of that proposal is one that a very clear um, use of 3D geometry from NearMap, so we, we've been, we pulled down uh, from the NearMap 3D platform. Um, in fact, we, we, we're really pleased that that came out because we've already started tapping into localised um, blocks. So we do shadow analysis um, over winter um, to see the impact of the, of the worst scenarios. We do um, the access to daylight on our residential buildings, which is a really highly sensitive area where you, know, you have to provide um, a, a percentage to, to habitable spaces within apartment complexes. So it's very important to get the accuracy of the information right. And it's not just about the old way of doing things, which is we're looking at a mapping platform and we're extruding boxes and anticipating the heights. It has to be much more rigorous now. And so NIMAP is an avenue for us to um, take that yeah, through. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's just taken that evolution of the sort of the, 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 the two-dimensional flat surface into what is, you know, what is real. I think you know, if anyone's gone through a construction in their own home and having an architectural plan from, from an architect or a draftsman, uh, putting that into a kind of reality element, so it just changes the perspectives immediately. And the ability to measure the height of a building or the angle of a roof or anything, those, they, those things can become such easy. Yeah. Where, where do you, I mean, we, when we started building this stuff, I mean, we, again, we are one of those innovative companies that sort of tries to find these, these use cases. Um, is 3D, just to open panel, is 3D one of those areas that will really open it up, like Tom said, or is this more like Hollywood? you know, examples. So what's your view? You almost use the word that I love using, which is the Hollywood BIM. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we're guilty of that, right? Um, Three-dimensional representations of construction projects win work. People love them, right? Being able to walk through them, being able to experience what that space will look like, right? Um, our industry is about selling a dream. So when we started building Barangaroo, it was two and a half metres of concrete over a literal garbage dump in the harbour. And now it's a place that, you know, everybody's wanting to go and move their commercial buildings into, right? I think one of the things that we find interesting is that the middle space. So even, you know, us, we, we, still, we still rely on some very traditional two-dimensional um, techniques, really, to build our designs because culturally and really how the industry has been taught is even two-dimensional diagrams have enormous amount of data actually built into those. So if you're a, you know, a trained architect, thickness of lines will give you huge amounts of information about those. But 
as roles and as the skill sets of people coming into our industries change, I think 3D is the great leveler. Um, it, it's actually much easier for people to visually understand how space works. Mm. I think one of the things which hasn't been really explored quite a bit is um, the pre-built or let's call it design collaboration in a 3D space where you can look at the effect of what's happening in your design, not only to that building, but also to the environment. Mm. Um, you know, classic ones, you know, in the news a couple of months ago was uh, we had a massive argument with one of our uh, nearby partners about sight lines to some of our apartments uh, that we're building in Barangaroo in a certain integrated entertainment precinct that oh. I think people are calling a casino. Yep. <laughs> uh, and so, just being able to get ahead of the curve on those things so you can prepare yourself for what the impact of not just your um, product is, but how other products right. impact yours as well. Mm -hmm. And this is where um, I, it's interesting. If everybody individually, like, so if Len Lease individually builds a 3D platform, right, we only know what we know. And um, that's why looking at these aggregated 3D data sets so people can start to work out what impacts are. Mm. I think that's a very interesting sort of space. What about, um, Stefan, what about in the solar world? I mean, think uh, it's, uh, it's useful or it's something that, you know, you, you would see more adoption of? For me in the solar world, 3D is fun, AI is useful. Mm. So I think, I think there's a lot of things in the AI with solar around identifying, you know, suitable roofs, particularly once you throw in shading and that oblique imagery you can offer, which is a part of the 3D. Um, I think that becomes really interesting for prospecting for roofs. I think, for, you know, Lend Lease could come to us and go, OK, here's our entire portfolio of rooftops. Tell me what you could cover with solar and where, because we know the more solar you put on, the more money it makes us. Um, so just, and, and someone could go and do that. They could sit at their desk and in a day, they could give you a proposal that says, yep, I can put on 32 megawatts across your portfolio. It'll cost you $25 million, whatever the number is, and you will make $25 million in three years. Um, things like that, that you just couldn't do before and you couldn't do accurately. Um, and I think that the, the, the AI piece, particularly the ability, I mean, it's super impressive to see the, uh, the adoption not only of, of, of solar um, in, in, in Australia, certainly there's a lot of swimming pools, there's a lot of different, you get, there was a lot of attributes that we can do. I mean, one of the things that Rob was talking about is ask NIMAP. Like if you were to, uh, Steve, if you were to ask NIMAP, what would you ask? That's <laughs> putting me on the spot. <laughs> quick, yeah, quickest way to Mac is... You are literally on the that. spot, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> you are literally on the spot, yes. Yeah, that's right. I'd, I'd ask some sort of silly question, how to make my life easier, right? Right. Or how to make my work easier. Um, yeah, look, I think... Um, I, I really think that there's a lot of, our, a lot of businesses, a lot of organisations, a lot of public agencies, whoever you are, are really at this point in, their, in, in history really looking at digital transformation. It's, it's, it, they're hearing a bit about the hype of it, but they're seeing some technologies coming through which are tangible to them now. They don't have to invest big to get access to this. I, even, I understand we've got a fairly big GIS contingent here, and they're probably interested in how technology is impacting their world. And in some ways, the things that Michael was showing are layers of information that GIS platforms already sort of offer, mm. but now it's done in, captured in a slightly different way. Um, merge that with 3D, and all of a sudden, and we are seeing now the merger of um, software companies, you know, like ArcGIS and Autodesk, for example, merging um, GIS and 3D. So you, all of a sudden, you're getting this um, more rich, uh, rich richer visualised, um, contextualised um, platform mm. to view that data. So I think we're in a really exciting sort of pivot yeah. point now. Can, can I give you one, one specific Go ahead. example, which has occurred to me just over the last couple of days of, of listening to what you're doing? And that is, so we provide, what we do is we manage rooftop solar for people who've already got it. So once you've got it on there, we'll maximise the value you get from it. So one of the things we could do is we could integrate with your platform and we could say, OK, using AI, we format the address and go, as soon as you have an image of this place which has gone from not having a solar system to having a solar system, upload the image onto the customer, and the customer can now see in 3D, automatically presented to them, we just immediately notify them when the image is uploaded by you automatically, boom, here's your picture of your new solar system. Real time, they can see it, oh wow, isn't that fantastic? Mm. They can see how it is, exactly where it is, what it is. Because most people who put a solar system on their roof, one of their number one complaints is, 
oh, I can't really see it. How do I show it off to Bob next door and tell him mine's bigger than yours, Bob? Or, or whatever their particular yeah, no, thing is. You know, and they yeah, go, they've spent a lot of money on it, they want to show it off. Yeah, I get, I get and they it. go, you know, hang on, what's yeah. this? They can see the detail. They can yeah. see that their installer's done a good job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the installer's left wires hanging out all over the place, yeah. they can see that and they can go, no, look, so you, ABC Solar, come back and fix that up. When you marry the, uh, the, the artificial intelligence side at scale and then you, you, know, you then sort of want to take it deeper into it, this is where I think we have a really interesting proposition, which is not just the scale of what you saw with Michael's presentation, it's actually the fact that you can then go, OK, well, now I want to see it for real. Like, I can actually go into the image and down to five centimetres, you know, in accuracy. That in itself, from a photographic point of view, plus also the you know, scaling it all the way, that's where I think it becomes really, really interesting play. Um, and, and, and most people want to do that. They want to be able to have a look deeply to see whether the job was done correctly or, or, or not. Um, so I, th I think it kind of gives you that, that range. It's all about putting that in the hands of a consumer in an easy way. Mm. So it's like Google Maps did it at a much yeah. less granular level. Yeah. Um, course, and yeah. that, that's what I think is really interesting. Yeah. I think, but, and I was going to say, one of the things that, um, that I see is very exciting, particularly around AI, is the, this concept of being, being able to help people augment what they do on a day-to-day. -day. Um, you know, lots of people talk about how digital disruption will change people's roles and low-skilled jobs will disappear. I, I, I have a slightly different um, opinion to that. Uh, I think there's always going to be need for the physicality of what it is that companies like us sure. do, right? Absolutely. The reality is bricklaying robots are hideously expensive and actually completely useless. But what is interesting when you look at platforms like Near Maps and things like that is they take away the busy work from people. So, I mean, everybody who's ever done any architectural work will remember those years where as a trainee architect you were doing thousands of iterations of the same building, right? So taking away that work that people have had to do in the past and replacing it with much higher quality work. So allowing people to actually do the things that they, were, that they actually are passionate about and they've been trained to do, but also giving a way to quickly identify the value that's falling between the gaps. Mm. Um, you know, classic example for us is we, we build thousands and thousands of apartments. Um, every bit of data tells us that um, people want kitchens, um, but every time you go and visit someone in one of our high-end apartments, a, a two years later, the instruction booklet's still in the stove. And so you go, well, do you really need a kitchen? And they go, yes, because you can't value an apartment without a kitchen. So I think one of the things that's interesting about um, particularly the AI application to you know, rich data sets like near maps is to inform the products of the future. Right. by looking at how it is that people actually use them the now. The predictability. The predictability, it. right? Because particularly construction hasn't actually changed materially since no, but, a long but, time. But, but for example, you could tell, as an example, urban sprawl, yeah. right? So if you think about how cities are growing, how suburbs are growing, uh, the amount of construction going on, and you see that over time, yeah, exactly. that, that can also help you predict what could happen and in the future as well. How right? these things actually yeah. connect together because cities are not, they, they, when they organically grow, you get a city like Sydney. When they're planned, you get a different type of city. So yeah. that predictability about how people actually use the built world is really interesting. Yeah, I've got a, yeah. Hang, hang on. Yeah. When they're planned, you get a Sydney city like Canberra. Are you arguing Canberra is a better no, city than Sydney? No, I didn't say Canberra. You would have. I was very noticeably said Canberra, one of our lovely projects. Yes. Um, it, it's interesting when you're looking at areas like um, Western Sydney, who are, where, where, where it's it's marked as a potential for huge development, and we look at um, how AI can potentially impact this. Now, as far as I understand, you you, you close the AI loop when it solves a problem. At the moment, I'm seeing a lot of machine learning, which yeah. is about at learning lots of data. And, and the more data, the better you can learn it, hence what we've seen Michael presenting today. But what, what we may not see is, okay, well, based on the fact that we've got all of this green space in this, in, in this environment and all this built form, where's the next appropriate place to put an airport? Well, I don't know where you land at, at wherever it is, Badgerys Creek, right? But I think there is a way that you can utilize this data and the human will be needed to curate that information. Now, 
the thing we're, we're starting to see a trend now in uh, computational design, there's probably a lot of people have heard of this, it's about the ability to generate thousands of options. Um, you know, Kieran, you talked about architects doing lots of options, well that's the world we're in, but we're making an effort at um, our company to use the power of computing that doesn't sleep, that can generate all of those options. And what we're finding is a movement towards designing not the single objective of putting something there and what it looks like. It's about using information and data. It's about understanding, okay, what's more important, access to solar or generating bigger floor plates because that's more economically viable. And those are two contradicting things. So someone has to make a decision on this or proximity to a rail um, way station or proximity to retail or where do you even put that retail? The machine will Compute, compute this information and start to give you iterations of it based on the priorities that you dictate to it. Following that, you get some, you can narrow down. So I don't think AI will ever complete, uh, will ever replace us. We're just responding to the information that's fed back to us. And yeah, um, that's of course, a, I think it's so, as smart yeah. as the intelligence you put into it. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, we're one of the uh, customers we spoke about in, in Melbourne were as a is a school a part of Department of Education which wanted to know trees overhanging playgrounds in schools and how far those trees will grow in the future so that they, they don't fall and hit a kid, right? So you know how do you predict that as well? And so again in, in over time if you can create understand what is the attribute of a tree, then that will then evolve into more information. So I guess these use cases will end up being even more interesting, but still requires you know, the human go-ahead to, to a degree. Yeah. Um, you, uh, Stefan, you must have seen, been very humbled by all of the new developments in solar, particularly in these new areas that I haven't even heard of, like Terra Nova, et cetera. Um, how's, how's, that, how's your industry particularly taking on uh, this level of growth? Um, solar is a really interesting industry because you think of it as a total clean tech new industry. It must be really like that. But there are, you know, there are 6,000 companies across Australia who will come out and sell you a solar system. And did I say before, if you haven't got one, you should get one. <laughs> um, most of these, the vast majority of these, are two, three-person companies using pen and paper to do most of what they do. So there are many companies who are using Nearmap, but they're actually the vast majority are not. They're not using these sophisticated tools because they don't need to, like it's... It's selling ice cream in the Sahara. Everybody wants it. So it's really easy for them to sell. They can keep doing it the same way they've done it. The market's booming. Um, why do they need to change? You know, they're not being disrupted because they're so small and so successful. They're hard to disrupt. So I think what will really turn it all on its head is when that sale becomes much more complex, so with the evolution of batteries, with electric vehicles, with some of the new regulations coming in by our grid network operators, we'll find that they are forced to become more sophisticated. And companies like Solar Analytics, like um, there's a whole bunch of other providers out there who provide them with services, will get there uh, providing better and better services using tools like Nearmap, which make it much more affordable for them. So they've now got solutions to access Nearmap that previously it cost them, you know, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars a year, and they went, "I don't make that much a year in profit. I can't spend that." Um, but they can now do it for, on just their small scale, for a few hundred dollars a year, and through third parties, and that's really working for them. So I think what we're going to find is that the quality of quote that you receive when you're buying a system, the quality of service you receive after your solar system is installed is going to ramp up radically over the next few years. I'd just like to thank Stefan, Steve and Kieran for attending the panel today, so please let them be welcome. Thank you very much.